Hello and welcome back to the Rope Access and Climbing Podcast. I'm your host, Mikey Stevenson, and today we are talking all things Sprat with Troll. If this is your first time here, please make sure to subscribe and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. So stay tuned. Step into your harness and get ready for a podcast about the vertical world. All right, well, let's dive into today's episode. Today, I am joined with a individual from Sprat um, by the name of Troll. Troll, do you mind um, kind of doing an introduction? Where are you from? What you do? Um, and kind of your placement with Sprat. Okay. Thanks. First of all, thanks for having me on here, Mikey. Um, Absolutely. And I really, really, I really, really enjoy what you're doing. Um, so I'm the immediate past president of Sprat. I've been president for the last four years. Tom Woods is now the president. Um, now I'm the chairman of the evaluations committee. I'm a Sprat level three and evaluator. Have been on the board. I'm also on our RATA level three. Um, I'm the training coordinator and trainer for Can USA. I also still go offshore and work jobs. And I'm also the technical consultant for Can Equipment Sales about selling equipment. Excellent. So, and I'm living, I live in Atlanta, but I work for a company that has offices in New Jersey, Houston, and New Orleans. So I travel around quite a bit. Excellent. Ken's fairly large company in the U S from my understanding, right? It's, we've got about 250 rope access techs working every day. Nice. Um, but can is can USA is owned by can UK. Yeah. And can but UK is Huge. massive <laughs> yeah. mind-bogglingly huge and yeah. they're not okay either so right cool um all right so today we're going to be talking um all sprat um and who better to talk to about sprat than someone that has been heavily involved with them for a very long time um talk about the future future of techs um how long it's been around uh, kind of what it stands for and, you know, the expectation in, uh, of, you know, the organization to the text. So that's kind of what our uh, episode the, uh, to today looks like. So, um, so diving in um, here, in your words, how do you best describe SPRAT? First of all, what does SPRAT stand for, for the people that um, are unaware of what SPRAT stands for, and then describe um, the rest. Okay, so SPRAT is the Society of Professional Rope Access Technicians. Um, we were started in the mid-90s, and it's a technician slash member-based organization. So if, if you are a member of SPRAT, you have a vote. And people were like, oh, we can't let the technicians tell us what we want to do. But that has worked out in our favor. Um, so it's a member-based trade organization that passes consensus documents about how to do rope access and what the certification scheme should be around that. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned it, uh, Sprat's been an organization since the mid nineties, correct? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and in that time, uh, where would the greatest growth be, um, time-wise? So like, was it, like right off the gate uh, or right out of the gate that the growth has been substantial or has it hasn't been in the last, you know, say five or 10 years? It's, it started, it started probably 10 years ago, but has severely ramped up in the last five years. Excellent. Um, I, I think that I um, have seen that. Well, I definitely on the IRATA side, I I've seen it, but um, you know, with, the lack of experience with Sprat, and obviously this is something that I'm uh, looking to pursue into here uh, as soon as possible is get into, into Sprat a little bit more and understand it a little bit more so I can talk a little bit, you know, equally on both sides. Um, so moving on, um, outside of North America, obviously everyone around the world kind of knows that Sprat is a North American um, entity, but Obviously, Sprat is kind of starting to move beyond the borders of North America. So where are 
you know, where can you find Sprat technicians elsewhere in the world? Well, that's that's the curious thing, because people that would approach me years and years ago and go, oh, Sprat's a U.S. thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, oh, half of our technicians are outside of the continental United States. Now, part of that does include Canada and Mexico. Yeah. And we've got over 11,000 certified techs in 37 different countries. Okay. Um, we've got 400, 450 plus members in 35 different countries. Okay. We are, we are based in the U.S., but we are definitely an international trade organization. Nice. Yeah. Um, that's great to see um, that, you know, you're, that the organization has grown to the, the point of, you know, becoming a international entity um, and recognized globally. That's great. Um, now, this has been a hot topic in the rope access industry. This has been a hot topic in, you know, different entities. Um, you know, definitely when you have, um, you know, large industry, oil and gas, you know, big commercial to small industry, uh, lightweight, uh, aspects, but what is Spratt's definition or take on double rope protection, um, double rigging plates, double pulleys, um, just that whole double aspect of things. Okay, so <laughs> rope access, we, we, the, the basis of our tenant is to have a working line and a safety line. Correct. That are independently anchored, correct? Yes. Um, so, but if that beam that we're hanging from is adequate to support the loads that are anticipated on it, we can put both of those anchors, the, both of those anchorage connectors on that one beam. Yes. So that's one beam that's supporting two things. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and what happens is we, we don't stick too much to, to defining what the competent person or the supervisor or the certified technician should do mm -hmm. as long as they're operating under the loads that they're supposed to operate under. So if, if you had a 12 inch beam and you said, hey, this is great. I'm going to hang one rope here. And then there's another 12 inch beam that's 40 feet away that had to be a different beam to anchor to. You could anchor to that and deviate back off of here. But if it's going to withstand the load, the anticipated loads, we say that's okay. And I think that's pretty much everybody, right? Yeah, 100%. Okay. Yep. So what happens is, is you follow that down to rope and edge protection. Yes. If, if I've got two steel edge rollers or if i've got one steel edge roller that i'm that i'm confident that the ropes are locked in and they're not going to come out i'm not going to have two um fair yep. we're getting, yeah we're getting away from i mean some people are still using it. it's a company based based on their rope access program whether you use a canvas rope protector what type of rope protector um edge protection and rope protection is very very serious and we're trying to address it to the best of our ability that that you need to understand what can damage the rope you mm -hmm. need to understand what can protect the rope sometimes it takes two sometimes it doesn't and that's where it falls on the technician yep it, it yeah 100 uh, percent. it falls on the technician um and you know one of the the things i'm trying to say or you know trying to put out there is you know when it comes to soft rope protection canvas rope protectors um there's obviously no standard currently with how robust this soft protector needs to be um so you know i i've put out these little fabric uh canvas rope protectors called them toilet paper um haha -ha, jokes aside i know but uh you know it's I've seen tests on them and they really don't do anything other than just smoke and mirrors. Um, and yet we have tons and tons of people uh, globally just putting both ropes through very soft, you know, brittle, if you will, um, less than ideal uh, sleeves on these ropes and just 90 degree edge over, you know, 
fairly abrasive edges, if not sharp edges through grading, stuff like that. Um, and like kind of my take is just like, why would you? Like, why would you take the risk? Why wouldn't you just put one sleeve on each rope? Um, because if that sleeve fails, the second rope is going to cut like butter more than like faster than the first rope. Um, I know in both Sprat and Irata, it's still, um, explained as it should, or the technician should put, uh, consider, you know, doubling it up, but it's not a shell. Um, I know it's a, it's not a, you know, a black and white answer. Like, oh, if it's soft rope protection across the board, it has to be doubled up. Obviously there's, you know, it's not a black and white answer like that, but when it comes to like rope sleeves, you know, I, I'm just trying to, you know, get the message out there to like have that greater consideration for doubling up these rope protectors. Um, you know, obviously we have, uh, some manufacturers out there that have done internal testing and have done extraordinary things for the rope protection industry or the umbrella of rope protection, uh, for soft rope protectors, um, and hard like DMM has done a great job with both sides of that spectrum. Um, but you know, we're still seeing tons and tons of people, um, you know, not protecting the ropes adequately. And it would just really be nice to see organizations to kind of put their foot down a little harder or make a statement and just be like, hey, like, you know, obviously through research, this, this, this is not acceptable. Um, and, you know, get the people thinking a little bit more. Um, and, you know, things don't, ch- you well, know, let- it, it, things don't change immediately. I, I get that, but. Well, let's think about where rope protectors came from. Let's think about where most of rope access came from. It was from rock climbing and mountaineering. Yeah. So if you had a, like yep. a rope that was, that was not over a sharp, you know, not turning a 90 degree corner, mm-hmm. but it was maybe going to be a braided a little bit. You put down some canvas and attach it to the rock and then you put a rock, a, a soft rope protector around it. Yes. So some of these things transitioning over to what we're doing is it's my personal opinion that soft edge protection is never okay on a 90 degree turn. Hunter, a hundred percent. I will, to, I'll back that a hundred, hundred percent. Yeah. So instead, instead of, instead of trying to protect the rope from the abrasive edge, why don't you eliminate the abrasive edge and, and provide some type of edge protection? Yes. Um, preferably that'll take a move rope so if you've got edge protection it'll take a moving rope you've got your anchors pre-rigged to lower it's a it's a good day 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. just a, like you know 90 degree edges sharp edges not abrasive edges but sharp edges why are people even looking at a soft barrier there it should be a hard barrier abrasive edges are a problem as well i've talked to several technicians and said that's really not going to be adequate. And they're like, well, I'm not moving side to side. I was like, have you seen what the rope does when you climb it? Yeah, exactly. It goes up and down. <laughs> I was like, sawing like that is still sawing. It's not sawing like that. Yeah. So, so it's something that we're, that we're trying to tackle the best we can and trying to inform the technicians of what they need to do. Yeah. And like, I, I, I get it. You know, I, I've, been around a little bit and you know i know that there's not a black and white answer and there it's not just a a simple statement that can just go out because there's so so many possibilities and it depends and this that and whatever else and so many different scenarios that you can just not account for but um just we got to start with education um and we need to get that education out there to make people think a little bit more well and one of the things that Sprat has done we try to give the the, the technicians the education and knowledge they can to to make the right decisions mm-hmm. but what we've also done is given a lot of that responsibility to the employers and their rope access program um i know certain certain rope access companies are not using soft edge protection anymore they're always using hard edge protection rather than rope protection yeah but if you had if you had a rope that was deviated that might come into contact with a, a 
small edge of a platform just a little bit and it's not in 90 degrees but it might solve like that yeah a soft rope protect will be fine yeah it's just making it's just getting people to understand that there's apples and oranges and making the appropriate decisions absolutely cool um moving on from the rope protection side of things rigging plates double rigging plates uh what's pratt's take on double rigging plates i know that this is a hot topic for a lot of people um so what's Spratt's take on this um okay on your harness you will have two attachment points that might have more than one attachment to it correct those attachment points have probably been proof tested and they are absolutely there is no way to open them correct okay so what what we are saying if 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 a device is suitably strong, unquestionably strong for the possible forces that could be put on it, and it is unopenable, then that makes a connection. So okay. as long as you've got a rigging plate that has two connections from the rigging plate to the load, then you can use that to connect to whatever you need to. So okay. you only need one rigging plate. You only need one single rigging plate providing... And we're talking rigging place and, you know, nine times out of 10, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they're a closed and uh, closed structure. Like yeah. you can't open up a rigging plate um, by any means. So cool. So that's, so that's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, like that's one big difference between the IRATA scheme and the Sprat scheme um, where, you know, in IRATA, you know, you do need double rigging plates or you know you need redundancy you need to, to back that well, up somehow and and one of the one of the ways you can do that is that you can use a single rigging plate and then mm -hmm. lanyards around to to do that load if you didn't want to use two rigging plates yeah so yeah. i've seen that some, i mean yeah. it doesn't say that you have to use double rigging plates all the time you just have to have that redundancy yeah exactly um excellent excellent uh double pulleys um what's what's the take on on double pulleys with sprat here so you go to that unquestionably strong and no moving parts and not openable and a double pulley has a, a an axle that runs through both sheaves correct if if that could be damaged then that would cons consist of one point so gotcha. and, and this is this is more my personal opinion mm -hmm. i'll have to check the evaluation guidelines and see what that is but most people in sprat if you run a double pulley there'll be a secondary connection to the tension line you're running down yeah or whatever it, it you're trying to utilize that double pulley for but nine times or out of you ten you're probably using it a double pulley on a tension line to get from point a to point b or whatever so yeah right or, or you could use two single pulleys yes absolutely but with the two single pulleys it's it's black and white it's you know those are two independent devices um yep, where i find yep, i see yep. the pulley the double pulley being an issue is well it has two shifts so it's it's fine it's made for two ropes well it, it's designed that way but it's still only one singular pin through so if any one item of a uh, a double pulley um falls apart disintegrates whatever you know the act of god if you will um the whole thing will fall apart yeah, yeah. um excellent so i i basically have beat that one uh to a dead horse so let's move on <laughs> um moving on here um are sprat technicians allowed to work alone we'll start there and then i'll move on to a couple other questions there so, so in the document, it says that you cannot work alone. The minimum rope access team size must be two. Excellent. Um, okay. So that's, that's preached everywhere. And if anybody has any questions about any of the Sprat documentation, they can go to Sprat.org, our website. We've just updated and upgraded our website. And all of our documents are publicly available for anybody to read anytime. Yeah. And they're very easy to uh, find. So... Make sure to head over to sprat.org for those documents. Um, okay, so the point, uh, moving on from the Sprat working alone, um, 
are now you know i'm gonna be i'm gonna be blame, uh honest here i you know this is why we're here is you know i don't know a whole lot about sprat so are there does there have to be a level three on every job um or you know readily available how what, what's the wording with that how's that okay, work? You, can, you can you can go to sprat safe practices and it talks about the the supervision so okay. it used to be it used to be sprat level one worker sprat mm -hmm. level technician and sprat level three supervisor yeah but we said for an evaluator to come in and in one day say this person could be a good supervisor that's a stretch i mean he may have some skills mm -hmm. and he's got the skill to be a level three technician but we can't really say he's a supervisor so we kick that back to the employer it's their job to decide who's going to be the supervisor okay and then in safe practices it says there are certain situations that if the criteria meet this a level two can be the supervisor on that job okay. most of them are straight drops if anything happens, the, the person that's working can be lowered to a deck directly below them or above them. No deviations uh, greater than 20 degrees. No need to have deviations. No aid climbing. No stuff like that. Gotcha. So, in, and it's not, and here's the thing, and this is what I tell all the classes that I teach. It's not what Troll says. It's what's in the document. Okay, the document says that a level two can be a supervisor. A prompt rescue has to be facilitated, though. Yes. Okay. Um, now, a uh, question on that about um, diving in a little bit here is um, rescue plan. So when it comes to the rescue plan, um, that's up to the employer generally or, the, you know, the supervisor for that, that job is – is 911 just like say you're uh you know a level two on a building uh washing windows you got a level one with you and you know you get stopped by uh osha and they're like so what's your rescue plan you're like call 911 um hopefully that's not the answer by anybody <laughs> any stretch of the imagination but you know in your eyes is that an acceptable answer no <laughs> perfect not even close <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. So, well, I, I mean, so what happens is, and this is, this is what we've said. It's like, sometimes you might not need to call 911 if, yep. if, if, if he's got a cramp and can't get down and move and you release the anchors that he's rigged on and lower him down, you, there's no health issue. There's, there's, there's no anything that's going on. Yep. Um, so, but it, it does need, you do need to know if they're, if you need them, if they're available. Yeah. It's like, and 911 is not always who you call. You do not call 911 on the oil rig. They will not show up. No, they so, will not. <laughs> so what happens is, is you, but you've got to have your rescue plan and then whatever emergency medical technicians you need to be able to respond to that if needed. Excellent. So that, Perfect. that answer your question? Yeah, it, it definitely answered my question. Um, kind of ran into a little bit of an issue uh, this past summer washing windows and OH&S stopped us and we had a rescue plan. We were all good, but there was another person on a building, you know, two blocks away from us that they were, um, they were kind of looking for because there was reports of an individual sole person washing windows on a building. Um, <clears throat> so... They were, you know, in the vicinity, so they stopped us as well and f tried to find out if we knew who that other person was. Um, if the person was Sprat or Irata, who the person was, I have no idea. It doesn't matter. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just like the one of the big questions that they asked was, what's your rescue plan? And I'm going to tell you right now that 911 is not a good enough answer for us. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Well, that's not the rescue plan, but <laughs> All right. well, it, it has to do. And, and, and as you're manning jobs, you don't put somebody in a position that is going to need to be rescued. So yep. it all has to do with, with job management and employer supervision. 
choices and checklists that are gone through and and then go through your rescue plan and know that if you do need emergency services they might be available absolutely obviously if there's emergency services uh sorry if there's an emergency that requires medical aid then yeah jump onto that number call 911 call you know whatever that number is for your area or whatever platform 100 percent, please do that but um (laughs) But, you know, the rescue plan is, hey, we're going to call the high angle rescue team to get this person down um, is is kind of what we're getting at here. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's and it's, so rope access, that's that's the reason we have upgraded the certification requirements to include more rescues and more planning so Excellent. that people understand that if they do anchors free rig to lower mm-hmm. rope access system and they go, what's your rescue plan? It's like, I pull a button. I pull a lever right here and lower him to the ground. Yeah. That's nobody has to touch him. Nobody has to go over there. Nobody has to get freaked out. It's all very calm. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, moving on, let's talk a little bit about the certification scheme. Um, so you have all three levels. You have level one, two, three. Um, I know in the last little bit, um, correct me if I'm wrong, 2019, you did a big revision to the syllabus is that correct 2019 um and you know in all levels level one level two and level three there have been a substantial amount of uh changes you know uh some great changes um and it's moving in the direction that i think a lot of people are excited for um now, one thing that I, one question that I get asked quite frequently is, you know, what's the big difference between Sprat and Iterata? And one of the big qu- things that I have to say is the hours um, for upgrade. So do you mind diving into that a little bit, please? Okay. When, when I'm asked about that, the, 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 and, and I'm also an Irata 3. The biggest thing that I can say is, is Irata is a company-based trade association that issues a certification for performing rope access. Sprat is a member-based trade organization that has a certification scheme for providing technicians with certifications. Um, so Irata is, correct me if I'm wrong, from one to two, a thousand hours in 12 months. Correct. And two to three, it's a thousand hours as a level two and 12 months as correct. a level two. Yep. Um, in Sprat, the certification, now this is the other thing. In Sprat, it's the bare minimum. Okay. Mm-hmm. The minimum you can have to move forward is 500 hours and six months as a level two. Okay. So it's still the same. Okay. It's still, yeah. That's still the same. We have, we have talked about adjusting that and that may still go out to ballot and do some other stuff. But what we felt like was we did not want to hit people that were innately skilled at doing this and being able to do the job. So we did not want to hinder those people because what we look at it as it is a skills based test that on the day you're going to be challenged and it's either a pass or a fail. Okay. That makes hundred percent. I, uh, sense, I get that for sure. Um, now when, now you did say that it may, it, you may go to a ballot and, and look at adjusting, um, those hours and, you know, people, you know, rumors fly. It is what it is. Um, you know, I've heard 750, I've heard a thousand, um, now, if it does go to ballot, what's kind of your take on that? I'm not really sure at this point. And, and okay. Mikey, I'm sure, you've, I'm sure you've seen this with, with some guys that don't do a lot of rope access, but they'll have a thousand hours, even though in those thousand hours, they never once did a re-anchor or they didn't negotiate the edge. All they did was set up anchors and went up and down. So yes. it's a thousand hours of setting up anchors and going up and down relevant to 500 hours of somebody that's doing huge re-anchors and aid climbing over water under oil rigs. I I don't know. That's why we don't know. But if you meet the bare minimum of that qualification, you can come and have your skills tested. And if you pass the skills, good on you. And if you don't, then you need more experience, whether it's time or hours or whatever. It's, It's knowledge. 
it's a knowledge-based skills evaluation. That's a good way to explain it. Excellent. Um, all right. So that's kind of what I have kind of originally documented. Is there anything you would like to add to this? Well, first of all, I'd like to invite anybody that wants to, to go to the Sprat.org website. All of mm -hmm. our documents are, are new and revised in the last four years. We started at the very bottom. We redid the articles of incorporation. We redid the bylaws. We redid the safe practices. We redid certification requirements. We developed and have updated evaluation guidelines. The evaluation guidelines goes through every exercise that you're asked to do in certification requirements. And it explains what the intent of that is and what should be asked when you do that on the evaluation day. Um, and it also has a list of some discrepancies and fails. The evaluation rubric is also public um, about what denotes a discrepancy or a fail. Um, mm -hmm. So all docs are on the website. Um, we've redone the, the membership station. So we've got company, premier, company, individual voting member. And then if you don't want to vote, but you want to be a member of Sprat and use the website, we're working very quickly on a, on a mobile logbook that, oh, app nice. that can, yeah, that we can do that. Um, so there could, there's a technician member who might just want to use that. And those are priced accordingly. Yep. Um, if we have put into play the evaluator app so that instead of as an evaluator turning in 37 pieces of paper that has to be scanned and sent to the Sprat office. And then they have to say, is that an M or a N or a E? typing that in oh have, that that nightmare <laughs> yeah so the technicians type in all of their information double check it make sure it's great we pop up the on on eval day hit the button screen shows up they do their eval we finish our punching the buttons it goes straight up to the cloud straight over to sprat immediately the technician gets um an email that says hey you completed your evaluation you have a provisional certification that's awesome yeah it, it, that is it, definitely a great way forward. Like kudos there. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So it, it has worked out now that being said, and I do want to mention one other thing, the, the, because we had this conversation the other day about the COVID weirdness, which is still the COVID weirdness. Yeah. I was actually going to dive into that question. Um, so please indulge everybody here. Uh, what is this COVID weirdness that you and I were talking about before? Well, and, and, and Connor did a really good job about it. So we, as, as Sprat, when, when this came out, we were like, okay, training centers are shutting down. Nobody's able to do training. They can't do anything, but yeah. these guys still need to go to work. So we said, okay, we're going to say that if you expire after March 16th and you have not been able to recertify, we will consider as long as you're working under ROPAC, Access program in accordance with safe practices and regulatory authorities that your cert is still good. And we said we will revisit that in November. So we revisited in November when everything was getting better. And we're like, hey, things are getting better. So we're going to say your cert needs to be like solid and updated and you have to have, have not be expired by November the 16th. So that was the drop dead date for that. But we also, because we're an international organization, there's places where you cannot fly in and out, be yeah. it a technician, be it an evaluator, be it a whatever. So after the 16th, if a technician has issues based on COVID, quarantines, travel restrictions, whatever, um, they can apply for an extension. Fair from enough. On the November 16th. Yeah. Um, so does that mean? Yeah, no, that's that's excellent. Um, now, now I hosted a Zoom meeting for instructors and uh, assessors, evaluators. Now there was a handful of us there. Um, I think it was, you know, it was positive. It was, it, it broke down those barriers between Irata, Sprat, companies, what what have you, whatever you want, and we just had a, a chit chat. Now one of the interesting things that came up during this was a 
more like a online evaluation. Um, do you mind chatting about that a little bit and, and how's that affecting this COVID uh, restriction uh, aspect of things? Like, obviously, some evaluators may not be able to fly to another country to do an evaluation or people may not be able to fly into a certain you know, country or province or state or whatever, but they still would like to put on a course. Um, is this a thing that Sprat's really looking at, you know, rolling out into the future to, um, uh, to better the, the process? Or is this just kind of like a, a hit miss kind of, we're going to give this and it's in kind of beta testing right now? It's, it's definitely in the beta testing method right now of, mm -hmm. of we are working on. It. Um, we have done some remote evaluations that went well. We have found out where some of the flaws were in that. We're coming up with a process of if you want to do a, 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 a virtual evaluation, you, we, we, you know, we need schematics of your building and, and the facility and what you've got hung and where the camera angles, camera angles are. and who's going to be able to proctor the walk around camera. And then there's probably only going to be certain evaluators that are accustomed to doing this. that are going to be able to do it. It's going to reduce the number of people that are doing it. Obviously you're not going to, you know, go in and have a room of eight people doing, doing everything. Cause you can't see everything from, from that, but we're working very hard on it because there are, there are people that cannot fly and cannot go anywhere. So yeah. we're, 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 we're working very hard to get that worked out. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. That is everything. Um, now, if anyone would like to reach out uh, to you um, for whatever question they may have, what's the best way that they can contact you? Yeah, they can reach out to, to my personal email or they can just send an email to sprout.org and it will eventually get to me. <laughs> um, Jody will just hit forward. <laughs> Excellent. If, if you've got if you've got a question, um, I, I would like to say this strongly, Mikey. Thank you so much for bringing up a conversation so that we can all talk about stuff of how because Spratt's main goal is to give technicians the knowledge and experience and the certification so that they can go work at heights, make a good living, and stay safe and go home at the end of the day. That's sure. what we all want. That's what we all want. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Cheers. All right. Well, thank you very much there, Troll. That was awesome. Uh, pleasure chatting with you again. Um, obviously, there's definitely some differences between Sprat and Irata, but for the most part, they're pretty much the same. And then it kind of depends on where you come from. All right. But anyways, yeah, if you like this episode, please make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Smash that bell for notifications as I put out new content every Sunday. And don't forget to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time.